everyone. We're going to get started now. Um, if you have any questions throughout the broadcast, we'll be monitoring the chat box. Uh, so feel free to ask anything. Um, you will be muted though, so we won't be able to hear any of you. I'm Maureen Babb, and this is Nicole Askin, and we'll be presenting about effective Googling. Yeah, great. So this presentation will be recorded and it will be available afterwards for you guys to review. And as Maureen mentioned, if you have any questions, feel free to let us know during the presentation. Uh, so what is Google? In case anybody doesn't know, uh, Google is a search engine that has very broad scope. So that means it's not limited to medical information in any way. You, so it's got a very extensive breadth that covers a lot of the information that's out there on the internet, but it doesn't quite cover everything. So you might run into cases where it makes more sense to use a different search engine, either because it has a more limited scope or because it has more in-depth coverage of a particular content area. Google has millions of results, uh, which can be a good thing because it means that what you're looking for is probably out there somewhere, but it can also be a bad thing because it means um, you might have to spend some time digging through to find what exactly you're looking for. And I don't know about you, but I don't really have the time to dig through millions of results. What? <laughs> so that's why I was thinking we could maybe talk about how to narrow down your search a little bit more. Also, Google has a pretty straightforward interface. It's just a search box, at least at first. So you can enter a couple keywords and you'll get stuff that's sort of kind of relevant to those keywords that you entered. But again, there's different ways of narrowing down your search to make it more relevant to what exactly you're interested in looking at. And we'll be talking a bit about that throughout the presentation. All of these features together make Google one of the most popular search engines out there. But keep in mind, it's not the only one. There are other options that you can explore that have different features, different scopes, different approaches. Uh, that might be of more interest to you, but we're going to focus our presentation today on Google in its various iterations. So let's take a look at the anatomy of a results page. So I've done here a simple search for IVF, and Google has correctly interpreted that I meant in vitro fertilization rather than one of the many other things that IVF can stand for. So I'd encourage you guys to follow along by searching with Google yourselves if you are able to at the time. And you might note that the results that you get in your search look a little bit different than my results. And that's because Google's algorithms are not just plug in this word and get these results. It's really based on hundreds of different factors that can influence the ranking of results, that can influence what appears on your screen. Um, those include your search history. So if you've done a lot of searching for one particular aspect of a topic, you might find that you get more results on that particular aspect. It can be influenced on your account if you're signed in. You can see in the top right corner here that I'm not signed in in this results screen. And it can also be influenced by your location. So you'll notice that I didn't specify Winnipeg in my search, but yet the first result that I get is for a Winnipeg fertility clinic. That's because Google actually knows where you are and it targets its results based on your location. So when you do a search, or if I did this search again, I might not get exactly the same ranking results. All right, other parts of the search screen that might be relevant to you, directly under the search box, you see the different facets of Google, and we'll be talking a bit more about these a bit later, but if you want news sources, if you wanted videos, anything like that, that would be the place that you would look to get that. To the right of that, you see your settings and your tools. So settings is where you can set things like your default language preferences, and it's also where Google has now hidden its advanced search features, which we'll talk about a bit later. Tools can be used to filter results down. So if you wanted um, only things published in the last year, for example, this is where you would find that. You can also see that down at the bottom of the screen, Google has started to incorporate some of these other result facets into the main search. So you see videos down at the bottom. And on the bottom right, you see a specific map location that is a fertility clear clinic near us. Also on the right, you see Google's attempt at answering your question quickly on the same search page. So this is a brief introduction to what IVF is. It's taken from Wikipedia. And because Google's figured out that when people are looking at a search results page, sometimes they just want a brace of definition. Sometimes they just want one little factoid of information. So this is their attempt to read your mind and figure out what you actually want. Uh, looking at the specific results, we've got 44 million answers, which is a bit more than I have time to read through today. But we've got uh, first result here is a fertility clinic, second result is Wikipedia, 
third result is American pregnancy. And we've talked about why that ranking might change depending on what you're searching for, uh, when or where you're searching from, that kind of thing. But you also have to consider, are these results really what I want to look at? And Marine's going to be talking a bit about how you decide. Yeah, so there are a couple of things to consider. One is that um, the results of Google are based on algorithms that are proprietary. We don't know exactly how they work, though we have some sense of what's relevant and what's not. Um, and it's based on not only your own search history, but Nicole's and everybody else's search history. Um, and that all feeds into the algorithm. But this can lead to things that are not necessarily what you're looking for coming to the top of the pile. For instance, if you're looking up stuff on vaccinations, well, depending on what the algorithms are saying you should be looking at, okay, you might be getting valid medical advice or you might be getting um, anti-vaccination conspiracy theories. We don't exactly know. So whatever, you're look whatever you pull up, even in your spare time, not just at work, but whatever you pull up on Google, make sure that you're paying attention, that you're assessing the quality of what you're looking at. Um, one simple quick tool uh, to assess results is using the crap test. Uh, so that's currency. Is it up to date? Is it as up to date as you need? Is it reliable? Is it so is it supported by evidence? What sort of evidence? Can it be verified by multiple sources? Um, if it's got citations, where do those citations go? Do they go to somewhere that's reputable or not? Um, also, authority, who created it? Um, and what's their expertise? If one of you who works in the medical field is creating a medical page, I'd probably trust it more than if I was creating a medical page. Um, or if my neighbor who runs a forklift was creating a medical page, you get that sense. Um, and then the other thing to remember is purpose and pro point of view. So is it biased? Is it trying to tell you something? Does it have an ideological bent to it? Pay attention to all these things and, you know, watch out for crap. Um, <laughs> but also consider what's the quality of the overall site? Um, is it what you're looking for? Is it at the right level for you or for your audience that you're intending to give it to? Obviously, if you're a clinical practitioner, what you can read and understand is quite different than what your patients might be able to read and understand. Um, and is there more than one perspective that you should be considering? And I'm not here just talking about conspiracy theories, but maybe it's a hotly debated issue and there are two sides that you should be looking at. Um, and assessing the information on or looking at commentary of the assessment of information on. Now we'll move on to going into things, going into how to do some search finagling to make your search better. So one important thing that you've probably noticed if you've ever done a Google search is Google doesn't really care if you can spell well. Um, it'll come up with, oh, did you actually mean this? And you'll be like, yes, I did Google, thank you. <laughs> um, and this also impacts uh, Canadian versus uh, um, American or British versus American spellings of words. Um, so even if you put in honor without a U, it'll search for results that are honor with a U and so on. Um, and a lot of times the little filler words, the, uh, at, those don't matter, but sometimes they really do. So if you're following along, if you could compare the results in your search for who, so W-H-O, versus a who, versus the who, um, you'll see quite different results. So for mine, I ended up seeing the World Health Organization for the first one, as opposed to say a defini definition of the word who, which I suppose might come up for other people. Um, ahu, like Horton hears Ahu from Dr. Seuss, and the who, a band from uh, back then. Um, <laughs> I don't actually know which decade they're from, but I do like their songs. Um, so Google, uh, Nicole has already mentioned some of the facets and we will be going into them in more detail uh, as we progress along with this session. Um, images, videos, news, books, 
and Google Scholar are some of them. There are other aspects as well. There's Translate, there's Google Ngram Viewer. We won't be talking about those ones in particular, but do know that Google has quite a few services. Um, when you're doing a search in Google, uh, it doesn't understand questions, with the exception, I would say, of how-to questions. How do I tie a tie? Um, but usually it just wants the keywords. It just wants answers. So your search will be more effective if you're writing just the key point of what you're looking for as opposed to asking a specific question. Um, there are some other things. Word order matters. Um, your first words will be more important than your later words, and you can mess around with that if you're not getting exactly what you want. Um, and there's a little bit more on our next page. Uh, now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Boolean operators before, um, but that's the and, or, and not that's often used for searching. So and looks at, you know, um, if I'm searching for Nicole and Maureen, it will look for Nicole and Maureen together. Whereas if you're looking for Nicole or Maureen, it will pull up Nicole by herself, Maureen by herself, and Nicole and Maureen together. Um, so by default, Google search will search for all your search terms and it'll try to put them together with ands. Uh, you can use ORs by typing in OR in capital letters or using the pipe or bar symbol, which is that one that's above your slash on the keyboard there. Um, and so you would, if you were searching with that, you would put word, no space, bar, and then the other word. And that's really only relevant if you're doing hugely long search strings. You probably won't need it and just using or will be fine. Um, but the other thing to remember, or is often used to track synonyms, this or this. Um, Google often tries to find related words. So it tries to find synonyms. Um, and it tends to search, you know, if you're searching for skiing, it'll often, it'll also search for skis and um, whatever other ski jumps, ski jumps, <laughs> um, whatever other ends to the word that you'd be looking for. Um, you can also deliberately exclude terms from your search. So for instance, uh, by putting the little minus sign directly in front of the words you're looking for. So if you're looking up nursing, but you don't want breastfeeding, you'd put in nursing and then have minus breastfeeding. Um, and that will only be as good as the metadata provided for the websites, which many people don't provide good metadata. So be aware that it's, it's not always going to be as effective as you want it to be. Um, and then also be careful about this because sometimes removing things with the minus symbol that is the not function will remove items that you wanted to be in there for example if you had an article that says this article is about nursing but not about breastfeeding and you had the minus breastfeeding you wouldn't bring mm -hmm. up that article because google can't understand that it's not about breastfeeding means that it's really not about breastfeeding yeah it sees the word breastfeeding and it's like oh you don't want that in there and just tosses the article in the trash. Um, and you can also use parentheses, so brackets, to specify how to interpret your search results. So nursing or medicine and education or training. So you're looking for either of those two different things. So one search is nursing or medicine, and the other is education or training. So that means that you could be looking for nursing and education or nursing and training or medicine and education, or medicine uh, and training. Yes. Um, I'll pass it back to Nicole now to talk about some other search hacks. All right, so you can search for exact phrases using quotation marks. So this will mean instead of looking for Winnipeg and regional and health and authority, you can just look for Winnipeg regional health authority as one thing. You can also use this technique if for some reason you don't want to search for other synonyms or related terms. So if you just wanted to look for skiing for some reason and you didn't want to see any results that has skis or ski jumps, you put skiing in quotation marks and it'll come up with that exact term. When you're doing this kind of search, you can also throw in wild cards. So if you remember part of a phrase or a quote or something like that, but you don't exactly remember what all the words are, 
you can throw in an asterisk in the middle. So for example, cognitive asterisk therapy will find cognitive behavioral therapy. In some databases, you could do cognitive behave asterisk therapy to come up with behavioral with the American spelling versus the British spelling. Don't do that in Google. Google just does that by itself automatically. You can't actually replace parts of words in Google with this technique. You can also search specific sites or domains. So if I wanted to look for guidelines on the WHA website, I could search guidelines site colon WHA.mb.ca. You can also use this if you want to search domains in general. So if I want to look at only Canadian websites for guidelines, guidelines site colon .ca will get me everything that has a .ca in the domain name. Similarly, .gov for US websites. And you can use the techniques we talked about already to combine these in different ways. So if I want Canadian or US government websites, site.ca or site.gov, and then put that in parentheses and add on the guidelines, and that'll get me the combination of both. You can also search for specific file types. So if you want just PDFs, if you want an Excel spreadsheet for some reason, if you want PowerPoints, uh, you'd use the ext colon. A command to look for that. So wound care in quotation marks, ext PowerPoint, PPT will give me uh, PowerPoints about wound care. And finally, you can search specific parts of the page using in title or in text commands. So if you want to find a systematic review about fentanyl, you really shouldn't do this in Google, but just in case, uh, fentanyl in title systematic will get me um, art articles about fentanyl that have systematic in the title. So that would be probably a systematic review. And then again, you can combine these in different ways. So if I wanted a guideline about wound care that's in PDF form, I could do a wound care, maybe I want a Canadian, so site.ca, in title, a guideline, ex extension, PDF. And that'll be a great combination to get a very, very narrow search from what is some general concepts. And I just want to add to that, that you can also use file type, all one word for the same thing as the ext. Um, so file type colon or ext PowerPoint. It works. Yes. Yeah. And if you can't happen to remem remember all of that, you can use that advanced search feature to help you construct a search. So this is hidden from the main Google results page. It's hidden under the settings. Um, so you can click through that to get to the advanced search. And this covers many of the topics that we've talked about already. So in the top section here, we've got our Boolean search. So all these words is the default Google search. I want Deborah Che and guidelines and whatever else. This exact word or phrase covers those quotation marks. Any of these words would be the or option. So rather than typing out or, 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 you would just put a number of words or phrases in here. None of these words will subtract things. And just remember, be very careful about doing that. And then down at the bottom, you have some of these advanced search features that we've been talking about. So site or domain, I want only sites from the WHA. I want only sites from Canada. Uh, last updated, that's where you would find under the tools in the main results page. I want results updated only in the past week, in the past month, whatever else. And there's a few other options here that you can search through if you find that you're getting too many results and they're not exactly what you're looking for. This is another option for you to try to figure out how to narrow it down a bit more. All right, Google has some other fun search features that maybe won't help you narrow down your search, but can be really helpful in your clinical practice. So you can use it as a calculator, and it's really quite useful for you uh, doing conversions. So if you want to convert pounds to kilograms, you want to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, you want to convert Canadian dollars to euros for some reason, that's something that you can do right in Google without having to look up what the conversion factor is and then trying to figure out how to do that calculation yourself. For certain foods, you can look up nutritional facts. So if you search for avocado facts, you'll actually get a thing in the right-hand sidebar that's um, the breakdown of the nutritional value of an avocado per cup or per whatever other measure they use. They have um, 100 grams, you get this number of calories, this amount of fat, this amount of vitamins, that kind of thing. You can set up a stopwatch. So you can set a timer for five minutes and it'll start a timer for five minutes, or you can do a stopwatch that counts up as well. Uh, there's the translation option, so Google Translate will translate uh, single words, or you can go to translate.google.com to translate more extensive paragraphs of information. You can also do other things like flipping a coin, rolling a dice, or playing Brick Breaker. All different things that you can do with Google. Yeah. A quick note about the translation is that the quality of translation gets worse with the greater volume of text that you have. So. 
a single word is probably translated accurately. An entire page of a book is probably not. All right, so we did mention that there are other facets of Google out there. So this is an example of a Google image search page. Uh, just like we've been talking about all these techniques you can use with the other Googles as well. So if you want to um, look at images only from one specific website or one specific domain, you can do that. So you can use the exact same techniques. Uh, some of the differences, though, is um, the tools options will vary based on which specific facet you're looking at. For example, if you're looking at videos, you can actually narrow down your search by the number of video results, um, sorry, the length of the video. So if you want only like a 30 second video versus a 25 minute video, you can do that with those tools. Uh, for images, you can look at particular colors, you can look at sizes, you can look at um, licensing. So if you need a Creative Commons license image for a presentation or something, you can use that uh, filter to narrow it down that way. You can search for clip art versus portraits or whatever else type of image you need. One other really cool thing about the image search, I don't know about you, but sometimes I've saved images to my computer and I don't actually remember where they came from. Uh, there's that camera icon that's in the search bar. And if you click on that, you can actually search for images by uploading a copy from your computer into Google and it'll do a reverse image search to tell you where that image actually came from. So the last thing I want to talk about quickly here is our Google Scholar. This is one of the many facets of Google, and it's one of the most useful ones in terms of doing actual research. So in this, um, this design looks a little bit different from the regular Google, and you'll notice that there's only 1300 results here as opposed to 44 million. So it's a little narrower of a search than the regular Google, which is great because it helps ensure that you get more research results in your search. However, you still have to be careful about evaluating. Not every single thing that's in here is going to be a great source. You're going to get some predatory publishers. You're going to get some content that maybe isn't peer reviewed. So you do still have to do the evaluation techniques that Maureen was talking about earlier. And you also have a lot fewer filter options. So you do still have the date option and you can get rid of patents or citations if you want to, but there's not as many filter options in this particular search as with the regular one. Um, on the left hand side of the screen there, you have the option to create alerts. So if you have a search that you want to get updates on on a regular basis, that's a way for you to do that. I would recommend not doing that with uh, very simple searches. Yeah. Um, even in Google Scholar, you'll get a lot of results uh, for just fentanyl. But if you're looking up fentanyl and this and this and this and this, and it's exactly your research interest, then that's a, a reasonable amount. You can also use it to keep track of authors that you like. Mm -hmm. And another option that you have to keep track of authors that you like, if you look at the second result on this screen, you see that the author name is underlined. That means that this particular author has a profile in Google Scholar. So you can actually click through that author's name to see everything that they've published that is available through Google Scholar and to get on their information about them, like their affiliation or their um, academic criteria, uh, credentials or that kind of thing. So on the screen, you also see not only the title of the articles, but also the journal name and the publisher, which can help you in evaluating the credibility of the source. Um, under each search result, you will see those quotation marks, which will actually show you formatted citations for the particular search result you're looking at. Uh, you see the cited by and related articles options. So cited by will show you everything that's indexed by Google Scholar that cites this particular article, which can be really helpful if you're trying to track um, the change or um, evolution of an idea or concept, that kind of thing. Related articles will help you track articles that Google by its algorithms, algorithms think is closely related to this one. So if you find an article that's perfect for you really on what you're interested in, you can use either of these two options to try to find other articles that are similar to that. And finally, you've got the all six or all seven or all 10 versions button. And what that means is that Google has actually indexed multiple versions of this particular article. Maybe there's one at the publisher website, one at PubMed, one in an open access repository. So sometimes you can actually use that link to find versions of an article that you do have access to, whereas maybe the main one is paywalled and one that we don't subscribe to. Um. So that was our presentation in a nutshell. I'm happy to respond to any questions and you can also contact us later if you run into any problems.
Yep. And once again, the slides will be on, or the video of this will be online and we'll be sending out the slides to everybody who registered um, for this presentation. Uh, we've still got five minutes, so we're just going to stick around for a bit. Uh, see if anybody has any questions. Don't be shy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and if you'd prefer, you can always uh, uh, phone us or email us later if you have questions or are having trouble with a particular search, we're always happy to help with that. Yeah. And just as a note, this only really scratches the surface of some of the fancy searching that you can do in uh, Google, but this is a, a half hour uh, <laughs> session. And before when I talked about um, metadata, I actually used the term incorrectly because Google Scour is not just metadata, but the full text of the, the item as well. So if you were do, I was using it in the context of the not filter. So if you were doing minus sign breastfeeding, that would remove breastfeeding, not only from if it's mentioned in the meta, metadata, which is like the source code um, for the website or, or any additional information that's provided in, um, the archiving of the information, but you can also, it would also remove any instance of it even once, even if it was mentioned one time in your entire 200 page article. So I guess you wouldn't have a 200 page article, your 200 page book. <laughs> oh, we have a question, excellent. Um, can you repeat the bit about reverse searches for images? Sure. So if you're in Google Images, uh, you'll see a camera icon that's in the search bar. So you can click on that and it'll allow you to either enter the URL of an image or to actually upload an image from your computer into Google. And then Google will look for instances of that image on the web. So if you upload an image from your computer that you don't happen to remember where you got it from, it'll actually come up with this is where it, this particular image can be found online. Yeah. You can also drag and drop it into the camera box, the image from your computer. Um, yeah, does yeah. that answer your question? Hopefully. Okay, yes, good, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. Um, all right, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, so we're going to log off now. If you do have more questions and we've cut you off in the middle of typing, unfortunately, we have no way to tell if we're doing that, um, but feel free to send us an email and we'll follow up with you for sure. All right, good to see you, bye. Do I make